Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I couldn't believe this gentleman was real. I mean, I was looking at his Wikipedia page, and I saw his website, I saw his YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and I said, this is an incredible story, an incredible musician, and someone very, very special. And I wanted to share him with you, because I think mm -hmm. he is someone who I think deserves way more attention, way more uh, notice and I, I hope that this interview because I, I couldn't find another English interview. I mean, I guess they are, uh, but I, I'm excited to be maybe the first like proper one. I think here that people can see on YouTube that would be really nice. So Professor Emil Naumov, he is a professor at uh, Indiana University, but he is you could say the last disciple of the most the famed pedagogue Nadia Boulanger. And he is just really a, a tremendous person. Um, Nadia Boulanger herself has, has said some incredible quotes uh, that I just want to highlight. Some just some really f amazing ones. I, let's just start with one. OK, this is a great quote. Uh, let's where is this? L let me just let me just bring up your website here so people can see. Get a load of this quote. The future of music as I this is Nadia Boulanger, by the way, as I see it. As I always have, Plato was a genius, Stravinsky was a genius, Boulez was a genius, is a genius, and I believe that my little eight-year-old Emil Naumov is also a genius. So, I mean, there we go. And that's from one of the most famous teachers in history. So, Emil, welcome to the show. I'm very honored and very humbled, and as well as very touched by the reminiscence of these words of my teacher, while I hope that the rest of my life since her death, almost now, more than four decades ago, doesn't prove her right because it's unreachable <laughs> by sheer humility, but that I am a true hyphen between her aesthetics and my students who are my pride. <laughs> well, let's start with maybe the, the let's frame it because people who watch my show know that I have uh, almost an obsessive sort of investigative uh, impulse to want to understand improvisation and composition. How do people who do it well, how do they think? What, what, what are they thinking of? How do they do the way they do the things that they do? I mean, what systems do they use? And I got very interested in, I mean, I had, uh, people know I had a jazz theory background. I went to Berklee College of Music, but I explored classical music because I always loved classical music. And it always seemed like, like, for instance, the theory that I learned in college, the Roman numerals and the function theory didn't quite capture what, what, how, really how to to do that stuff. And then I discovered Partimento, I discovered figured bass, basso continuo, general bass, and I, I started to see that this was a little... And now, the the professor that I really admire, Professor Robert Yerdigan, is a very... He talks a lot about the Paris Conservatory, he talks a lot about France, and he mentions Nadia Boulanger a lot. He talks about how she was one of these great teachers. She had a certain way of teaching that very closely sort of mimicked like the, the 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 historic way of that was done in the past like i don't know i mean i it, she, he had a lot of admiration for her um and i i just anyone who was associated with her i think was is worth talking to so first of all what interests me about you is that you are a composer you are an improviser you're someone who is i would say fluent in music it's very hard to find some, someone who is like that, fluent in music, not just playing it, understands it, can create it. And you have to see this man's YouTube channel. It's ridiculous. I mean, like, I think since we discussed coming on the show, you had already like recorded 
a couple of new in, uh, improvisations. <laughs> just like like just you uploaded like a few, and it, it's like a tap. So like you're you're like a tap. If I turn it on, the music flows. It's unbelievable. So I'm not sure where we should start, uh, Emil, but maybe we could just start about composition and improvisation. When did you start composing and improvising? And can you, when's your earliest memories of that? I started composing as um, soon as I started playing the piano when I was five. And the reason for which this was a very um, necessary um, deed, which at the time I didn't formalize intellectually since I was a child, was that I was um, hungry for more after the piano pieces I was given to learn as a child. And so uh, after the last bar was finished, <clears throat> and I played it through as I was told to do it repetitively because that's I was an obedient child, but my ear was thirsty for more. So I was fuddling around. And then um, my father, who um, had previous lives before my birth, one of which was a musician, he, and this is early 60s, so before computers, mm. he took on ear dictation my improvisations and wrote the score, most likely filtered by his awareness of how much he could capture from it. And um, I was practicing my own piece with a score handwritten by him just like I was practicing the other pieces that I was assigned to play. And so <clears throat> he recorded me very early on a reel to reel where I was improvising and then when I was pl playing them. And so the very fact that I couldn't notate them brought me to practice them as a somebody else's piece with the notes written out. Uh, because of course improvisations are uh, ephemeral by essence, they disappear as soon as they are made. It's like dreams. And um, about three, almost two and a half years later, when I was spent seven and a half, when um, long story short, they brought my parents brought me to Nadia Boulanger, who was already in her mid eighties. Um, I was um, chosen <clears throat> by her because most of the other teachers that I was exposed to by my father for advice, <clears throat> they said, let him grow up and one day we'll see what he can do. But for now, let him play in terms of playground. And uh, unlike the others, Mademoiselle Boulanger said, um, the little one is thirsty and he needs to receive the knowledge every day from now on for at least the coming 10 years. <laughs> and so the first, um, first um, I'd say, year or two, a little before I was 10, I grew up to be independent from my father for the notation of my thoughts through the, um, what we call in French, solfège, but it's really more like musical grammar. You can call it ear training, but it's all combined with early music theory for beginners. Enough for me to be able to uh, formulate on paper my own thoughts, regardless again, like with my father, how much it was filtered by my capacity to harness those thoughts. Uh, and Abiel, so, can I just ultimately... ask, can I, can I jump in and ask a question? What was the sort of music that you played a lot up to 10 years old? Like, what was the music that was that you digested, so to speak? Like, the kind of did you play like Beethoven, Bach, Chopin? Like, what was your literature that you had consumed? Well, I um, it was interesting to observe that I was not treated as a child prodigy in terms of demonstration, and therefore my repertoire was very much ground building with um, 
Bach simple pieces, Mozart simple pieces. Of course, nothing is simple, but <laughs> in terms of right. I was not playing Bach uh, or any showy uh, piece as a child, because both my parents and my teacher considered that I am not a child prodigy, I'm an, an early old child. Mm. In a way, I was taught seriously a lot of things that are taught to young adults in terms of the musical grammar. Yes. But all that was only because in my case, and I don't generalize for others, I don't know, I know for myself, I always had this urge need to express myself through the sounds. And um, the fact that I played Debussy or Chopin or Bach or Beethoven um, was wonderful um, landscapes or soundscapes, if you want. I didn't know those words then. And as I wanted to stay longer with some of them because I felt like the piece wasn't long enough, besides practicing it, I was... Um, so it's not about imitating as it would be the case for some. I have had a chance to teach a child prodigy, Jean-Frédéric Neburger, who is now a young adult in Paris when he was five years old. And um, he was a musical sponge. If I gave him to a side tree, the piece by Chausson, then he would come up with a concerto next week for flute and piano or with orchestra reduction in the style of Chausson. But uh, in my case, uh, when I compare comparables, uh, I get an inner world of music that is talking in me, still, uh, still is, and already did, except that the fact that I could notate it was the great freeing. And so because of my pianistic progress to play more difficult pieces, my compositional writing became also more complicated. Okay, and so wait, it was uh, like Emil, I, I think, okay, so uh, let me just go back a little bit. I want to ask you about your theoretical framework. So I, I do understand what you're saying. It makes a lot of logical sense. But I, I read in your book, which I encourage everyone to check out. He has a phenomenal book on his website that's free, um, My Chronicles mm -hmm. of Nadia Boulanger. Um, you, you, there was a chance that you would have gone to Germany, right? Germany to study composition, but you didn't in the end, I think. Or uh, there was, there was, then you ended up in France, right? So, did you study composition with different teachers, and they had different ways of approaching it? And so, really, my question is. How do you, what kind of theory do you use? Is it the French way? Um, do you use basis chiffre with the figures, the, the numbers under the bass? Do you use Roman numerals? I know you're in Indiana University. Everyone, America, they like to use function theory and all of that. So do you use any sort of framework like that or is it all intuitive? Oh, no. Uh, the intuitive is the given. And um, just like the mother tongue, which you all spoke yourself um, by ear when you were born. And then you learn the grammar in order to write, read, and think in the language that you already speak. And I think that is not replacing the intuition, it's reinforcing it with awareness. And my teacher um, undertook to teach me um, harmony. Of course, I was introduced to a teacher at the Hochschule in Vienna mm -hmm. and in Berlin. Uh, and um, as I was telling you earlier, uh, my father received the answers of, it's okay, but let him grow up and come back to me later when he's 18. Mm. And the only teacher whom we consulted and um, who said, I want to teach him right away for 10 years daily was Mademoiselle Boulanger. Mm. And my parents uh, trusted her and um, I trusted um, what she was bringing to me, which was a beautiful combination of um, strictness in the harmonic sense of the rules, 
for instance, she was very good at teaching me harmony um, with a subtlety uh, and not the rigidity of the forbidden for, for, forbidden rule, uh, rules that forbid you to do voice leading that leads you to do parallelism like fifths or octaves. Mm -hmm. And she encouraged me to um, develop a thinking of um, voice leading with contrary motions. So rudimentary contrapoint and some level of uh, keyboard and written harmony. That was, um, and I'll tell you how, that was weakly um, mm. shaped around the and fugue of the well-tempered clavier a week. Mm. Copy by hand, saves, copy from memory in lesson, and then play from your own score with the gaps. And uh, after several rounds of the 48 weeks, I ended up uh, knowing the pieces, not as if I composed them, but understanding the flow of the follow-up of the voice leading. And so this um, desire of my teacher to uh, encourage me to hear polyphonically layered, and not only vertically, where the two hands on the piano easily verticalize, as you mentioned, the um, figured basses. It was also about the beauty of the inner voices. And when it came to those rules that all students have to learn how to um, um, respect uh, the parallel fifths or parallel octaves or not dubbing the leading tone, she introduced, even when I was seven, immediately that dual concept of tolerated and forbidden. Mm -hmm. And I mean that because I was in parallel always composing and I was composing parallel fifths, but I did not confuse that um, the freedom of my creativity is not stifled by the, uh, the strictness of the rules of my grammar learning of my musical language, if you want. And uh, stylistically, she was... Um, very uh, eager for me to express myself uh, in my compositions uh, free of any rules. And so in the same three-hour lesson, which I had quasi every day, <laughs> I had a strict sense of the rules with the harmony, <clears throat> a strict sense of freedom with my composition, um, <clears throat> which I was presenting to her in progress. And then there was the, my favorite part of the lesson, the discovery of words that she prepared for each lesson for me to sight read and comment while I discovered them. That was a variety of styles in her presence. And all that with the well-tempered clavier weekly. And um, I must say that if I was not creative in my inner desire, I would have found this too tough. Hmm. And uh, the only reason I enjoyed it is because I felt like I could dig inside me what I could hear, but I couldn't formulate. Hmm. And so, she was asked if my music is, um, as a composer, uh, like my concerto when I was 10 that was conducted by Menuhin, mm. and I played the piano, uh, if it music is in, um, influenced by Bartok or Stravinsky, or she mentioned neither except Shostakovich, but not totally, she said. Mm. In fact, it's really herself. Now, that is very difficult to define because nobody writes music that comes of nowhere. Yeah. So we have subconscious or conscious awareness because, of course, when you're a child, you might do intuitively things that were done by others before you without you knowing it. And somebody who knows it says, oh, this reminds me of 
let's say, I don't know, uh, Kachaturian. And I would say, I don't know who's Kachaturian when I was a child. Mm. So that mm. doesn't tolerate you from searching for what it means to you, what you hear, the intervals, the direction of the line, the meaning of the phrasing. In other words, um, I was presenting while work in progress to her in my compositions, always finished sections. And so the question of yours about the improvisation, which was at the very start when I couldn't notate, when I could notate, and my teacher wanted me to elaborate the musical thoughts uh, in order to take out the redundancies or whatever makes it unnecessary formally or stylistically or even um, in terms of the very uh, writing, <clears throat> she discouraged me from continuing to improvise at that stage, mm. roughly between... Mm. And then 17 when she died at the age of 94. After which I developed a career as a concert pianist and um, did a lot of transcriptions because I felt the need to add some creative portion to the repertoire that it was not my own, but I did Firebird by Stravinsky, uh, Romain Juliet by Tchaikovsky. Um, because I was key pictures at an ex exhibition, you did your own transcription much later. That was a much later um, reverse engineering since <laughs> that was, uh, uh, well, anyway, the point of the story is that the transcription, the interpretation, the composition were three channels that I didn't confuse even when I grew up after her death. But the improvisation one was left aside because I was too busy um, learning repertoires, performing concerti, mm. being a concert pianist and enjoying it while composing very much. And um, therefore elaborating in my mind the music. Whenever um, I reached um, the uh, late 30s, early 40s rather, I discovered the freeing feel of improvising without any stylistic or thematic or any boundary. It was more like I just let my mind flow, which is exactly what I do when I improvise. It wasn't an experiment or, a, or, or some kind of a added um, know-how. It, it was just the expression of the spontaneity of the world of music that I hear in my head without to have to notate it. And uh, I must say that in the last uh, 15, almost 18 years now <clears throat> of doing that, my own compositions started becoming uh, more fluid inspired by the fluidity that comes from the improvisation. So you're saying the improvisation <clears throat> has had a very positive effect on your craft of composition. At least to me, yes, because what slows you down when you compose is notating. it. And so what I developed as a craft from improvisation for the writing, which is independent from it, again, not confusing the genres, is that I am able to better um, accomplish the flow of the composition rather than being sectional or organized by a formal decision that was given to us by the centuries before us. And there is something um, which is very beautiful about improvising is that you start which I think is beautiful allegory of life. You start, you don't know why, like you're born, and you don't know how it's going to end, like you don't know how you're going to die. And so in a way, when you elaborate the composition, 
it's more structured. You organize and you place already a frame in which you organize your thoughts. And it's a beautiful intellectual while inspired, but also intellectually framed organization of the flow of the thoughts. Do you recommend people who are composers, do you recommend that everyone should improvise? Is it a good thing if you want to work towards being a better composer? Is it a good thing to do? I don't recommend anything to people I don't know. <laughs> I, only, I recommend only uh, if asked respectfully for their own, um, whoever they are individuals, uh, I give them my um, uh, point of view of what I think they should be pursuing in order to reach more the inside of what triggers them. And I think that it's a very respectful thing because when um, Mademoiselle Boulanger was a student of Fauré, her co-student was Ravel. Mm. When Ravel was in New York in 24, he meets Gershwin who wants lessons from him. And Ravel writes to my teacher in Paris, as two recently former students of Fauré, he says, this young man is very successful on Broadway, but he wishes for more. And that's where I find it so specially important to be respectful of this vulnerability of the talent that he says, by bringing him what he thinks he's missing, we might break his inspiration. Mm. And ask her, do you have the courage to undertake this, which I don't. Can I, okay, wait, hold so on. Then, I, I want to... Give me another Ravel. Yeah. Mademoiselle Boulanger just want me to be another Fauré. And I think in that case, in this case, when you ask me, do I suggest that people should or shouldn't, I don't think of people as a group. I think of individuals whom mm. I meet or who ask my advice. And some are more intuitive and some need more to organize their thoughts. And I think that um, it's, um, it's something of an intuition you have about the other. Mm. And that's probably the base of what my teacher was, a very intuitive teacher, because the type of students who were around me for the 10 years I was there, her last 10 years, my first 10 years, but snippets of years of other students who are mainly Americans in the last 10 years of her life coming to Paris to study with her, there were not two of, well, not only, but mostly, uh, there weren't any uh, common points between them. Some are more theorists, some are more composers, some are conductors mm. or want to be, and so on. So she had some common ground of musical grammar that Mademoiselle Dieudonné, her assistant and her gave us. Mm. But what we did with it depended on what was triggering us. And she didn't try to um, stifle it or to um, encourage it if she didn't think there was really there something to encourage. And so if she discouraged, it was very discouraging because you knew that, okay, then I'm not good for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, let me, let me, you believe, uh, I you get trust. what you're saying. Um, I just wanted, it just, it just came to mind because you were talking about that. Um, this is Eric Satie, of course. And I, I read in his Wikipedia page and since you, you, you have a lot of experience with French uh, music. So he actually went back to study when he was older to study counterpoint and, and he to study more formal. And I think, did he receive some sort of criticism from his peers? Like, Hey, he's the, what he, he like when he initially got his fame, it was writing those very personal sort of compositions. And then they said, maybe that schooling that he got maybe kind of affected that, that original spark. But I don't know. I mean, I, I, I I don't see a problem with getting more craft in your tool belt, but what what do you think about that opinion? That maybe that when he went to get more training, it kind of maybe you could say affected his that original spark, that individual spark that he had. I don't believe that people evolve in their intuitive uh, creativity. I think that if they are extraordinarily um, intelligent, like Stravinsky, they are able to transform themselves in terms of their creativity to whatever they think is the fashion style of the day or the country where they are in. Mm. 
it doesn't make them disingenuous. It just makes them extremely adaptive in their uh, intelligence or their um, um, their in th their intuition. Um, whenever others need to construct their uh, craft and know-how, and then everything has to fit in that ideology. Would it be twelve tone or microtone or tonal? As if the language defines the essence. When my teacher considered that the essence defines, at least the inspiration, defines the form that it will take or the style which it will express itself in. And that's why I find that um, she was not um, the, um, the teacher of a doctrine in music. Mm. She uh, had very strong admiration for Stravinsky's neoclassical period. She was for his um, child, like when she was a last pupil. Um, so these two universes were very natural to her. Um, and I inevitably uh, was very comfortable in, this, uh, in these two musical languages, unexcluding others. But um, my problem often is that people who are involved in composition always think about the tools and become so virtuosic in their tools that they don't really mean anything with through them. And I think to a certain extent, uh, Gershwin, um, Schubert, uh, Satie um, um, are the example of composers who didn't need a great know-how to express something so personal that is so fundamental to us. And you could argue that perhaps learning too much might, as Ravel was fearing for Gershwin when he wrote to my teacher about it in 24, might um, 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 dry out his um, creativity. And you could argue that um, uh, jazz can be a gimmick, neoclassical um, a gimmick. Um, everything can be a gimmick because it can satisfy an intellectual construction of the mind. But I think that what she valued, and which I think I feel extremely privileged that she did not, um, I would say, censor me in, is to always keep while accumulating knowledge in musical um, theory, to always remain able to be very, um, free in my creativity. That's easy to say, difficult to do, because the more you know about other composers, the least you dare write your own, because then you think, oh, that's already been done. What's the point for me to do it again? And that's, one, that's why I find it so sad when many composers or budding composers abandon composing, because people keep telling them, your music reminds me of this, this, or that. And then after a point, they say, well, it's all done, so I have nothing else to do. I give up, or then I'll go into a system that will be my own, that nobody else will understand, really, unless they learn my language. Like, I invent a language to write my novel because I don't want to write it in a language that others can read it. <clears throat> so that's the whole point of my teacher's... Um, Wasn't it Stravinsky? Somebody said that... Um... There's still a lot of music left to be written in C major. <laughs> Somebody said that. I don't remember who it said. Maybe it was Stravinsky. I'm not sure. In my case, it was Jean Francais who told me that. Um, and it was specifically because he was living around the IRCAM um, in the uh, fourth of this in Paris. And I would um, visit him. After his dinner, he used to take a walk around his apartment building, which passed in front of Irkam. And I used to ask him, aren't you troubled, Maître, that music is going in such an atonal directions? Because he was still writing at 80, very tonal. And he told me that sentence that you attribute to Stravinsky, possibly that Stravinsky taught him, perhaps. Mm. Regardless, it's sort of common wisdom. He said, there will be always room for somebody to write something that will be new within, let's say, a C major tonality. In other words, the banal obvious. And the problem here, I'm 
wanting to share with you and your um, your followers is that between being genuine and banal, people are afraid and they shut off themselves. Who's deciding if it is genuine or reminiscent of somebody else? And, and even if it were, why would it be less important? Because I discovered with age that the creative flame comes as it does between the innate and the learned. And you cannot erase what you've discovered, nor should you stifle what you feel or hear innerly. Therefore, even if reminding you of somebody else's work, there is always a branch of, at some point of the musical development of the thought where you say, okay, that reminds me of, but not fully. And that's why it's so striking to observe when you analyze music of composers. She was very encouraging me to do Brahms, Ravel, um, Chopin, uh, all the composers we discover. We learn about their gimmicks. Okay, Brahms who goes with parallel sixths and Chopin uses a lot of chromaticism on the way down. And um, um, to give an example, um, um, Ravel uses a model tonality. Um, so you, you can imitate them when you learn some of their um, specificities, but you can never define them only by that. In fact, you recognize them by that, but you cannot define them by that. And so even if today or tomorrow, rather, uh, artificial intelligence will be able to come up with some pastiche of some composer because the computer will put the things together mm. and you'll have a synthetic piece of a given style, it will never be what beautifully comes into one's own inner world, which is contradictory. You hear something and you know it's not right. You don't know why. And when you think it's right, the next note after the one before, you write it down or you memorize it and you say, that's it. And then you try to organize the next notes. And so it, it seems to me like um, instead of searching what most of the 20th century got lost into um, post-tonalism, is not to <laughs> That's putting it lightly. <laughs> the world is not about escaping tonalism. It's about inhabiting it with your own personality. And that's why um, nobody told Rachmaninoff, you know, it's about time that you give up um, writing like Chopin. Oh, that is such a great uh, topic. And this is a great topic. You brought up a really huge topic that, I mean, there is indeed, I think, an enormous pressure if you are a young composition student to push the boundaries, to do something weird, unlistenable. Nobody's going to listen to it. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, I'm not a big fan of all of this kind of serialistic music, atonal music. I just don't like it. But, I mean, how do we tackle this topic? It's a huge topic, right? Uh, let, let me just bring up one thing. I was thinking about this thought today. I want you to react to it. Pierre Boulez, your teacher said it. He was a genius. And I think he was... And you know, I'm a Catholic. I think he was given gifts by God that were like he I think he was natural like you, I think, given incredible gifts. And how you use those gifts, I think, is just, you know, is a distinction. There's a distinction there. So you can actually be a genius, but you know, I heard is uh the the atonal um what's it, the piano, second piano sonata? Now, not something I would listen to for fun, you know. I mean, but I can recognize that a genius could create something like this. But again, it's like I can think of a, uh, an analogy with philosophy. There's Hegel and Aquinas, and both of them are geniuses. I don't agree with anything about Hegel, but, and I pretty much agree more with Aquinas, but I can understand the distinction that they're both geniuses. And, and I, I wonder, uh, Emil, I, I would love, you're a very eloquent person. What, let's talk about uh, this, this, um, this age in the 21st century. I mean, Young, a lot of young, talented, talented, clearly young, the future geniuses. Is it is it a mistake if we push them into this post-tonal world when there is, like you were talking about, is there more music to be written in C major? I think 
think that um, by essence, creators hear what others don't. And therefore, um, if it's reminiscent of something else, then people frame them. And if that is the case, then the case is closed. But what happens is that you don't choose when you appear in the history of life solution. So if you and I met in the 12th century in Anders, or we meet uh, in another place in Asia in the 23rd century, <clears throat> of course, our perception, awareness, uh, contextually of the music of the past or the music of the time is very different until almost the beginning of the 20th century, all the music that was played, written for church or um, uh, non-church purposes was the music of the time. There was very little knowledge and awareness of the music of their own past. And I find that the publishing companies and the recording companies have uh, gangrened the conservatories to become this kind of system uh, where we produce constantly the reality of a past. So we have to give, as a piano teacher, when I have a student playing a Chopin ballad, I have to find a way to bring them to an inner soundscape that wants to what is the texture of the time, the contextual texture of the time. Well, they played on an instrument that has nothing to do with it, where they have a psychology that is not theirs. The impatience, the longing, the expectation, the what types of readings you do or what kinds of um, um, thinkings you do. Um, so, of course, somebody like Boulez was uh, not only a genius, but he was a leader in terms of an uh, intellectual leader, just like Schoenberg was. The problem is not with the leaders, it's with the followers. Because some people choose to follow blindly because they want to be part of this group and or, or this master, and it becomes a, a chapel where um, the others are rejected. And I remember uh, Boulez writing very critically about Stravinsky's neoclassical period. Now, um, I grew up to, when I was a child already, to say, I like, I don't like, like all of us do. And my teacher specifically at the very get-go told me, don't say you don't like, Tell yourself, I don't understand. First, then go to it later, because some pieces cannot reveal themselves to you. The awareness that you have to receive them is basically like develop your antennas to reach other things. The problem with the post music is that um, it's very often a system that justifies itself by the language, not by the essence. And so for those composers who write post-tonal language, genuinely, I think it's well, regardless if you are listening to it and you're lost. But the more major problem is that if you hear a music that is tonally constructed, then it refers you to everything you have heard before, so then as Mademoiselle Boulanger would say, the bad music of the past was at least boring at most. Today, unlistenable. <laughs> In order to wait, wait, so, can can you, did she, what was her opinion on post tonal music? What did she think of it? The, what she thought about it is that um, very few are genuinely inspired by it. And most of it, is used by people who have little to say or nothing to say in music, who use idiom or that know-how in order to um, exist, uh, but without a substance. Because if you use the common language, you'll see that they're empty. But when they complicate the things intellectually, then you're so flabbergasted because you don't know what it is or means. Therefore, you give up. So I would say that <clears throat> she was a very close friend of Stravinsky through his transformational um, styles. 
And when he reached his dodecaphonic style um, later in his life, when he was against it earlier in his life, when he went into the neoclassical, um, she always said that he was genuine in every style he was exploring. But she still preferred his earlier works from the Russian period. Mm. Um, what did she think of Schoenberg? Because if that, Arnold um, Schoenberg was, I mean, I, he wrote some fantastic late romantic works, that very listenable. Uh, and then he was kind of the, the leader of the second Viennese school. And, you know, so what did she think, think of, that, of Schoenberg? I think that she um, thought about the <clears throat> 12 tone system as an alienation because it locks its world within instead of being an open world to different styles. And she was very interested in the music of the very old, at the time, in the, we talked early 70s, about the music of pre-Renaissance. Oh. And she's the one who the Verdi and shoots to um, recordings, that, which was never done before. <clears throat> and she was encouraging Copland and Francais and other of her students of the time, uh, Markevich, to compose their music. So she used to say that contemporary music and very old music are equally disturbing because they're equally challenging us. The problem very often is that when a composer like Boulez or a composer like um, Schoenberg, besides their compositions, become theoreticians and cult leaders of, an, of, of a point of view <laughs> that leaders. they decide. But it is that uh, very few composers of the past were aware, deeply aware of the music of their past. In other words, how much did um, Schoenberg or Chopin or Stravinsky know about the music of Hildegard von Bingen? Probably nothing. It doesn't make Chopin a lesser good composer, etc. And I think that in this century, especially now, where the music schools encourage a lot of study of the past, even through the instruments of the past, reconstructions and all, we end up having these uh, very specialized um, people who do contemporary ensembles or Baroque music ensembles or Renaissance ensembles. And you have these scholars that are <clears throat> very, very knowledgeable in these specifics. And then when you try to be sort of um, as a pianist, for instance, um, encompassing it on your instrument for music that necessarily didn't have a keyboard instrument to be written for, um, but you play it on the piano as an instrument of trade, um, then you become an unserious musician to the eyes of the specialists. Um, at least now we have this plethora of specialists, of plethora of time periods, Whenever until Brahms's death in the beginning of the 20th century, they mostly knew the music of the immediate time. For Brahms, Beethoven, and Bach were the greatest ones. And so would it have had changed anything for Brahms to have known more about music before him? Of course, he couldn't chronologically know the music after him. I recall about your question a um, letter of Funak to... Um, Louis de Villemorin, where he attended um, the um, prayer of Boulez's piano sonata in the hall, and he wrote to her in a letter, I never imagined music could go in that direction. <laughs> and the fact is, is that when he wrote in 1949 his violin and piano sonata, he wrote to her, I'm going to write a violin and piano sonata which won't be for diva and harp but for two equal instruments. And so I was thinking, there is always a need for a composer to state something against something else, either because I am against neoclassicism and I am Boulez, or I am against um, um, 
do the caphonic music and I want to write only tonal music like Jean Francais did until his death in 97, a very old. Um, you could argue that all these people were stubborn because some of them were aware that music had gone in different branches, but um, it didn't let them develop it in that direction, as I mentioned earlier about Rachmaninoff. And so when you listen to their music today, or you study their music today, or you write about their music today, of course, chronologically, you place them somewhere in time and in space, obviously. But ultimately, you listen to the Greek concerto for what it is, and the Rachmaninoff concerto for what it is, and you don't compare what was written at the same time, because then you get lost and you think, so was Brahms more old-fashioned writing his last intermezzi at the end of the 20th century? Did we see more modernistic writing at the same years, his early image to be uh, the 1897 one? And so you can say, oh, the one was avant-garde, the other one was old guard. That's not true. I don't think that one should think like that. And my teacher always um, taught me to discover, um, rediscover sometimes, um, um, go back to some things I thought I don't like. Um, and it takes a lifetime and some don't come up and some become more uh, meaningful to you because you have different venues to enter in their, in their music worlds. Basically, it seems to me like the tonal system was a common language and the post-tonal system is a language for each composer. <laughs> and so in order to have <laughs> more of a given composer and to appreciate all what he or she comes up with, you have to learn their language. So you mm -hmm. cannot read the novel in translation because it makes no sense. Therefore, you have to learn the language of the novel you're going to read. Mm -hmm. And so it takes you years before you can read it. Okay, and Emil, so I think I'm for, uh, that's this, exactly what this is a good segue. This is this is a good segue now. So I wanted to talk about something a little bit more pedestrian, actually. Here's an anecdote I want you to react to. So I interviewed Professor Robert Yerdigan, and he talked about an advanced music theory seminar where they took a piece by, a, by Rachmaninoff, and they were unable to come to an agreement on where to place a Roman numeral for analysis. And I... And I was just, and I was thinking to myself, look, if this advanced seminar with PhDs, the brightest of the brightest, right, can't agree on how to analyze the music, what hope is there for a person who is maybe a first year harmony student, or maybe someone who's so confused? And, and so at a lower level, much lower level, most people when they play classical music have no idea what's going on. They just, it sounds pretty and we play it. It's nice. And uh, we're not even talking about comp like advanced composition and you know form and all of this. And like I often feel like if I could just listen to a piece and really grasp the essence of it at a basic level, I would be very happy. But I feel like it's getting harder to. I feel like, what's your perspective? Of this and maybe you could give your teachers insight. And in, is there things that she didn't like in analysis? Are there because analysis is not just one thing. Yes, there is the common period. But there are like many ways to analyze something, and theorists are arguing all the time. Schenker, Riemann, uh, you know, uh, there's the Paris Conservatory, there's the Germans, there's a lot. Of, so, what is your perspective on that? I think that it ultimately doesn't matter. <laughs> I think that. How you name the things is how you define them through your um, capacity of analyzing them. But when they don't fit, their musical language doesn't fit in your um, paradigm, then what do you do? You reject it or you open more. And I find that to be the case, for instance, with Fourier. His style is extremely uh, classical. His language is very modern in the sense that he doesn't search for a climax in the middle phrase to justify its expression. And then you have these um, harmonies which are ambivalent because they can be at the same time in both keys, 
but you don't know in which one they will go if they do. And so when you do the uh, Roman analysis, then you're in at a loss because you have to uh, uh, analyze the harmonization melodically. I like to say that to piano students when they play Chopin. The right foot pedal holds the sounds. The left hand of Chopin plays the harmonization, would it be arpeggio or whatever pattern. But then it blurs the melody and you don't have two keyboards. Mm. Therefore, the right foot pedal is harmonized pedal that brings the harmony um, to exist and to hold the sounds you cannot all grasp with the same hand. But then the melody gets blurred. And if the melody is clear, then you like a bass note or you like a harmony. And so I advise them to pedal melodically instead of harmonically. And I think in that sense, um, the analysis, for instance, Mademoiselle Boulanger used to analyze the first bars of the well-tempered clavier first prelude, one, two, five, one, and then it becomes six, and then you go two, five, one in G major. But then you return to D minor, which in fact is second degree of C major, five, one. So you could say, I didn't modulate, I only went in a secondary dominant of the dominant. Or did I really modulate? And who decides it's important to know if you did or you didn't? And I find that it's very sterile because people would argue, no, an F sharp in C major is immediately a leading tone to G major, therefore we modulate. Then you have to see the proportions. Okay, how long do I stay in G major to define this compared to C major and say, okay, perhaps I'm still in C major, but going to my secondary dominant. And I find that ultimately when the listener hears the music or the performer plays the music, you said most people play without to know what they do. They just hear it. I think that it's wonderful, but it's extremely limiting. And so I only think that the amount of knowledge of music theory should correspond to the amount of need to the expression either of the red note, either of the imagined note if you want to create it. And I think that if you want to create it, then you learn, of course, you mentioned the um, harmonic um, um, learning of music. Mademoiselle Boulanger developed a concept way before I arrived to study with her, obviously, that she called in America keyboard harmony, which in French is called classe d'accompagnement, where you apply all these um, rules of um, polyphonic well-being of the voice leading that just shows how well they behave with each other, equals among equals, um, in real time. And very often when you do the continuo, people just pluck chords that correspond to the harmonization without any voice or leading um, meaning in between. And people were satisfied by that because at least it's the right harmonies. And so if you can do that in real time and think the voice leading in layered polyphony and in real time, um, that's what I do when I improvise polyphonically, um, of course, you can develop more your thoughts when you write because you have the time to think. But the real time of the flow of events is very express, uh, special. And I think that um, having um, brought me to read the two viola quintets by Mozart on the piano during my lessons was a revealing situation where I realized that you can really do expressive dissonances beautiful inner lines that nobody hears because of the cross voicing. But when you read it, compared to what you hear, you, you feel like the notation doesn't always translate the composer's, um, um, let's say, um, the composer's intent. And then what do we misunderstand from the filter of the notation? It leads to our interpretation. And then people who like it say, I like it by this rather than by that person. And so we start saying, oh, no, I want to hear the high enough concerto with you, Jawan. And no, 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 I prefer it with such and such. 
So <clears throat> it's like blind people being read something <laughs> and because of the way they, you no, know, because it's true that <laughs> the ideal would be music language to be taught in schools for non-musicians, like a language, like mathematics. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so then the people can hear the music by looking at the music without to have somebody be a mentor who makes them discover it. And they can say, I like it, I don't like it, not because of how it's read or played, but because of how they read it. And very often I have students who learn a piece after they have heard it. And then they look at the score and they're at a loss why the notation doesn't correspond to what I hear. Why do people take freedom with it? And I think it's because no matter how much detailed the notation of music is, it doesn't encompass all the subtleties of the musical thought. And so I find it very moving to me personally in my short life on Earth, which is for how long is going to be, is that when I notate some thoughts of mind that are genuine, and that somebody in the world reads them and plays them, and I hear it, which is already a miracle, for most composers never hear their music played. I realized that, for instance, my viola and piano sonata was recorded, and they sent me the recording, and I listened to it, and I realized that the notation translated all what I felt was embedded in the musical emotion, thought, uh, expression, whatever you want to call it, in the narrative um, process, without me being there to tell them, oh, this is why I wrote it, or this is what it means, or this is mm -hmm. supposed to be, or why don't you do more that or less that? In other words, <clears throat> I welcome the fact that the music might appear different of mine to somebody else just by the notation, because that's probably what I do when I play the music of the dead composers. How do we know we don't betray them? Right, like for instance, Bach do doesn't have really any articulation in his music. I mean, you so in in that sense, like you, we can't really check with him. Like, are we playing it correctly? So, I, <laughs> I mean, people have done a lot of musicological research, but like again, it's 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 the you only have notes there. Can compare his uh, type of 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 design of the patterns to violin pieces where he did put the bowings. Mm. And so you can do it too by saying, oh, this is how they did. With the bowings of the time, they slurred three and untied one, like ta da ta ta ti ta 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 But on the modern piano, you can do ta ha 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 And who's to say he wouldn't have liked it if he had it? In other words, contextually replacing in its time, it can give us the information of how it was imagined. But since we played outside of the context of the ears and of the instruments from some of us and of the understanding, then by essence, we betray it with love because we do it with conviction, inspiration. And I think that uh, ultimately, uh, if musicians can read music like they can read a book if they know the language without to have somebody reading it to them, then they can be more critical about the interpretation and say, why? Do you do rubato there when Chopin didn't doesn't call for it there? And you can say, yes, but I feel it. Right. And then you have to argue and to, to explain it. And when students ask me about it, I used to be for the last uh, three decades uh, in my early very analytical interpretation argumentation. Mm. And then in the last two years, I must say that I directly say the composer told me. <laughs> and that, that brings a beautiful moment of um, fun and lightness in the exchange between the student and me. Because they realize that that's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> but I still think that composers who spend their life with a given musical um, language of a given composer, we end up by being familiar, like in a familiar place where we like to be, which is not our birthplace, it's not our culture or our knowledge, but it's something we we get to appreciate. Right, right. And we, have, so we end up conversing 
with the composer's thoughts while we play it ourselves to play stitch it. And so we change mind even while we evolve in our lives and say, why did I do too much rubato? Now I should do less or the opposite. In other words, um, I, I'm very deeply convinced that um, if we only played music of today, of course I could say something to people who play my music, but I am much more um, intrigued and incredibly blessed when people play my music the way it means to them, that didn't mean to me. Right. Just like any child means a lot to their parent, but when they meet a significant other, then the parent says to the significant other of the child, you don't know the child as well as me because I saw him or her grow up. <laughs> and so I can say this about the composition. I saw the piece as a baby, it was born with me. Who are to tell me that that's not the right tempo, etc.? Yeah. So, so Emil, we, we were talking about see this. The hour just flew by. The the hour oh, just flew by. No, no, no. I, I I wish you have to come back on again. But I maybe we should end off with just I have to, like maybe two questions that I want to end off. And this has been fantastic. I really appreciate that you're on. It's been really an honor for me. Um, I want to talk about okay. First of all, you you talked about um, realizing harmony. It was like this is this is Paul Vidal's basses, and is this something like you were talking about <laughs> Nadia Boulanger using something like this to realize harmony on the spot? Is that something what you were talking about? Well, obviously. <laughs> I memorized it since I was seven, which are possibly reminds me a lot of these days. But the point of so the that's, story see, is that, that's, <laughs> the, wait a second, hold on a second, wait a minute, wait, wait. The, what you just did—that's learning harmony. I mean, for me, I mean, what I, as someone who's had to re-educate myself, I like this method of learning harmony. This is what I like. <laughs> what you just did. Can you just uh, let's let's. Can you just elaborate on this way of learning theory and this way of learning harmony? I think this crossword puzzle, really, it's what it is, is that um, you learn the harmonic progressions. <laughs> it involves parallelism, right? And a parallelism is what you want to avoid because you want to creatively uh, develop contrary emotions or common tones. Yeah. And so then you're thinking of uh, dispositions. What if I start instead of yeah. or how can I get to the next punctuation arrival? And when you have deceptive cadence, the first thing a student would do is this whenever they should do, which is dubbing the third in order to avoid the parallel fifths and creating a contrary motion. Then contrary motion leads to common tones. And then you create a melody. <laughs> what it would be? Of course, you need time to write it down, which takes long time, because you want to elaborate how it works. But unfortunately, for most people, um, no, most people cannot do this. Most people, and especially no, pianists, especially no. pianists, they, they see this, they can't do it. But the point is, is that when you play a piece like Mozart's K310, obviously you have a leading tone, obviously you have a tonic, and obviously you have another degree that you don't know what it is. So if you hmm, B is the second degree. Is that the second degree? No. So if E is the dominant, and this is, and you start thinking, what does it mean to me compared to how I hear it, to how I can name it? And this gap between hearing and naming is what you learn in harmony. What I meant by keyboard harmony is that you do it in real time. Like this. And you don't have um, <laughs> the luxury. To, and so when you, you can do very well a um, 
continuo where you play the correct harmonies but without voice leading just instead of or, or. so you you start hearing the tenor part the alto part the soprano part and how they move and who goes where in terms of the best um, uh, organized voice leading and so when you write contrapoint or fugue, like you can start like the Kiri of Bird Mass, and then you know the second voice, and then you know the third voice. So now you improvise it, and you start with something else, and then you go. And then you start thinking in real time, how do I move these voices? so that they can be agreeable to each other while provoking each other with dissonances and consonances, tensions and releases. And then, of course, it reaches immediately a point of a style. It's modal, it's tonal, it's chromatic, it's this or that. And I think that um, what's very important for a musician as a performer is to hear the inner voices even when they play the pieces where there are no you per se, um, to hear the polyphony in everything. Um, and I think that um, that's it's something that you train your ear for, and then it becomes a second nature. Ultimately, the challenge of a piano teacher, as I am, is to bring the student's hearing, reading awareness of the style of the notation to the level of the hearing of the composer. Of course, that seems like unattainable. If I play a Bach fugue, that means I have to be able to write a fugue in order to play a Bach fugue. Now, not everybody does that, but the fact is that when you study how to write a fugue, you learn the rules and you try to fit and you realize that Bach never used all the rules correctly. He broke a lot of rules for the beauty of the voice leading. But that before you know, you don't, because you assume he's Bach, he writes the great, so he knows the rules. In fact, he knows in order to bend them, which brings me to what I was telling you, that she told me the rules are there to forbid, but you have to also tolerate them in order to free yourself from them. In other words, those ties that you're given are to, to learn why they are there. And once you untie your hands, then you have to deal with that freedom. Same way with the organization of the musical thoughts, the organization of the musical creativity or the musical interpretation. Try to understand beyond the next note that is written on the score, what it would have been if he didn't go there. So if he did... Uh, say it's a variation of the same and you can go over and over on that but then since we have a notation we know it's this so then we value the repeated notes because it's a sense of desperation with the mother's death when he composed the sonata perhaps or perhaps we assume it but it would have been melodic we might have said oh it's a beautiful piece too Ultimately, the composer chooses, and we have to justify it for our own point of view of understanding. So I, I think that the harmonic um, lessons or the lessons in harmony bring you to um, try to closer to the DNA of the thought process of the composer that you try to guess why it didn't go that way and why it went there. And if you don't know why, you try to assume it and you go, yeah, it's better, not only because it is, but because it's not better, it's right, obviously. But you could say, I love it when students misread a note and they come at the lesson and I have to disclose it. And I know that they, they feel very upset because they liked it for a week the way they played it. And all of a sudden they have to play what is written because the score says it. And they misguessed it by intuition, but they didn't uh, misread it per se. Of course, ultimately they did. And so I encourage them by telling them he could have done or she could have done that, but in this case, you misguessed wrong. <laughs> and so um, better than to say, 
how come you don't read the right notes and play them? Because as you said earlier, people play notes without to understand where they go or how they are organized. I think that to be only aware of it doesn't help you play better. And to play only by ear doesn't make you play more musical. Mm -hmm. I think it's an individual uh, combination that has to be brought for each individual student's uh, um, desire to combine. I have a student like Francesco Tristano, who already as a child was very creative in jazz and classical and um, um, house music and in so many things. And he plays for Scobaldi as well as his own compositions. And then you have other students who are only playing the piece written by, yeah, I, I don't impose on them to be creative or not to be creative or how to be creative or uh, I, I try to to help them express themselves in what I sense is their yearning, but individually. Okay, wait a second. So, Emil, this, I want to just, this is the second and the final question, which I think relates to this, which is um, you, you teach the piano and you are, just from that, that the last 10 minutes, you are an incredible teacher. And you really, I think, really, it's it must... The way you managed to condense all of that information into one digestible bite was really remarkable. I really appreciated that. I want to get your opinion on something. I'm not a fan of the modern classical culture. I don't really like piano competitions. I really wish, like, if there was a piano competition, I would like that they improvised something at the competition. Yeah, let's see your improvised fugue, or let's see your composition, or let's you can uh, or let's have a sight reading contest like it's just a lot of things you could actually do in a competition that would be creative and actually really fun instead you know it's just playing the same piece very fast with no mistakes i just want to get back to the the culture that really rewarded creativity and rewarded i feel like we don't have that anymore i feel like if we're doing that it's we're fighting against the current and that's what i i get this sense and I always feel like for a young pianists, there's this pressure to prove yourself in some sort of competition. And, and and I know this is controversial. People like they're fast. They like playing fast. I actually like slow playing. I, like I, I, As I get older, when I was young, I liked fast. But as I get older, I actually can hear the music better. Even some of these like Chopin work, war horses, you know, I, I actually think the music's better slower because I can actually appreciate the composition better. But I mean... I mean, what's your take on the culture, competitions, you know, just this young pianist have you yourself, you know, you, you, uh, your, your teacher, Nadia Boulanger, saw you as a, just an incredible creative person. You became a concert pianist and, and, you know, you had a very solid career, wonderful career concertizing. But how do you see, do you think that this is sustainable and this, this sort of culture? I, I wish more people were like you, improvising, composing. You know, the piano, the, the, the player composer of, le of yesteryear. I think that um, the recording and publishing industries at the beginning of the 20th century um, changed the teaching industry. And uh, the competitions are like beauty pageants, <laughs> where you define, you define, yeah, you define a, a canon of what is desirable, and everybody tries to match it in order to look the most alike possible, and then therefore um, meet the most jury members' agreement, so the lowest denominator, which is to play clean is if that defines the playing. So the problem is that if you, as you mentioned, one should have competitions in creativity, you wouldn't have many entrance uh, candidates. <laughs> because, uh, no one can do it. <laughs> because even if when they were, let's say, intuitively young and ready to develop these qualities in them, if they had, whoever had that calling, it was um, stifled by being told, don't lose your time with this, learn this, pass this jury competition, jury exam. And so that's how we get to the point where we have this industrial quantity of production of performers who, in order to um, 
declassified, which is meaningless, but is done because there's no objectivity in subjective opinions, um, that somebody is number one and number two, etc. at some point, at some place. And then um, what happens then is that when they start a career, if they have opportunity to perform because of that winning, which is the purpose of winning the competition for performers, is that then the audiences don't care if they were second, first, or third prize. They go to hear somebody who tells them a storytelling that is so charismatic that they want just to be told a story, like a bedtime story when you're a child. Um, the same thing happens there. And all of a sudden, they are faced with this robotic playing, which was uh, uh, the key to, to get the chance to play for the audience. And then the managements receive uh, uh, feedback from the organizers of the concert saying, your pianist was very boring for our audience. But it's because that's what the music industry wants to. And if you have somebody or some people who are um, very original, very open to every musical style, and who are not, like they would say, jack of uh, all trades, master of none, uh, of course, they don't fit in that um, pageant's um, ideology. You have to have a certain... Um, way to be part of that group among which there will be an elite and there's nothing wrong with elite like in sport the problem is the elitism then where people start um arguing oh this is best player for that piece or this player that for that piece and i have been to international jury i was in march at the rubinstein jury in tel aviv with uh, highly respected colleagues, and none of us agreed with the final results <laughs> because our individual um, um, tastes come up with different opinions. And that is why we are a, a group of musicians who agree to disagree. And ultimately, uh, the people who um, will play concerts because of this competition will then discover while they develop their career um, what it is to contact audience, how the charisma with the playing the piece for an audience is another level of communication and fiction than playing it for people who know the piece like the jury members. Because inevitably the purpose of a performer in the case of a pianist is to play uh, a piece that people know or don't, but want to discover or rediscover. Whenever you play it in, a jury, in front of a jury, you play for people who know the piece, who already have a very clear concept of the piece, and who most likely won't like the way you approach it. Because you cannot convince all these people the very intricate things that are personal. And so, I think it's important to have a mentality which I carry since my teaching of Mademoiselle Boulanger with my childhood already with her, which is I prepare to love, I'm expecting to be um, convinced by alterity. In other words, I don't expect them to think, to understand, and play the piece like I do. I want to be uh, convinced by a student, by a competitor, by anybody. I don't go to a lesson with an idea that I'm going to, no matter what they do, I'm going to just deliver my system and say, do like me. I rather discover what it means to them. And I can say, this is, um, you should think about differently, but the piece goes there and how do you go there? And so I, I try to bring them to their own um, realization of what it means to tell their own narration telling of the same piece. And the problem very often, as you mentioned with the competitions, is that they standardize a lot of that. And the publishing companies and the recording companies um, make it uh, very standardized. And if somebody tries to be different, it's going to appear at worst or at best um, being irrelevant or um, completely crazy or um, untaught, like who plays like this, or it's not supposed to be like that. And you hear so many people say that. And to 
and again, eccentricity can be also the, 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 the case of somebody's um, opinion. When Gould played the Brahms concerto with metered uh, trills uh, conducted by Bernstein, Bernstein told the audience he's against the approach, but he's the guest mm. soloist. So this is already taking the responsibility to accept the alterity. And the problem when you're teaching very often is that it's easier to say, play like me, and I don't have to explain why. And then um, when you go to competitions, you want to hear who will most or best um, translate the musical charisma of the piece or the narrative um, drive of the piece beyond the notes. You know, it's that, unfortunate. Um, um, Emil, really I, I, I was just thinking that there's this pressure that if you're working with a young pianist and your you know their careers in front of them and i just you know if i were a fly on the wall i was just thinking here's a great musician incredible musician emil naumov and he has so much to share but the culture has sort of you know i mean there's a culture that all teachers who could like for instance how would Nadia Boulanger exist in this world right now? Like she would obviously reject this world, I think. What, 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 would, you say? what would she have to do with this sort of industrial complex of this factory of just, uh, you know, mechanized, uh, you know, th that just churns out? Yeah, I understand. Uh, when you cannot change the system, then get out of the system, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I strictly believe that... Um, I was a privileged in a privileged situation while on much pressure as a child to study so intensely with somebody so knowledgeable and so old and um, and keep the taste of it without to be um, let's say shut down um, in my own creativity or something. And so if I want to translate that intensity, that time that it takes to grow the musicianship rather than just demonstrated um, in, in concerts right away, um, not be applied fully with each student. But I still believe that the concepts of it mm. in the inner world that you help them develop for themselves is the true respect for them. And if they'll do it partially or later when you meet them at 20 mm. or at 30 in their life yeah. development as an artist, they may say, oh, I wish I learned that earlier, or I wish I developed that this way. No regrets. It's about giving the opportunity to encourage and be very strict, but at the same time, always be capable of being surprised about the human brain that is able to process a lot of things even later. And the problem is that um, the system of the competition ends the opportunity for this lottery around the 30, early 30 age. Yeah, it's so terrible. I wish, I wish, Emil, that when I was a kid, I wish I met you, you know, instead of like this, the 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 whole, I was, you know, I just remember, like, I, I know what it's like. There's this whole, there's this pressure that just pushes you into this direction. I wish I had a teacher like you. I mean, that would have changed my whole life. I'm more interested in learning composition improvising being fluent as i said at the beginning of the interview i think you're someone who's fluent in music and i want to end off with this quote i think it's incredible so we started off with a quote i think there's a couple of quotes i just want to read that i think are really great this is your teacher talking in 1972 talking about you a child with the most striking gifts a miraculous ear great intelligence great love for music enthusiasm and desire to learn a little bit incredible to meet such a child okay that's one wait i've got another one 1979 this is her talking about you he is he is only 14 and he has already written many works which have been performed successfully moreover he possesses the joie de vie uh, the the conscience to struggle as well as having a charming nature nature and maybe this is the, the most I think the most emotionally powerful, and I mean, this is really powerful. This is one month before she's, she passes away. She writes in a last letter to you. She says, I don't want to leave without having said goodbye. I have too many things to tell you that you already know. 
I don't say them to elicit gratitude because I know that you understand what I have done for you. But please realize that you have given me more than I have given you with all my tender affection. I mean, you know, I want to cry when I read that. That's incredible. I mean, that's, that's, that is such beautiful, such a beautiful thing, a bond with a, a clearly a teacher, one of the most famous teachers with a student that she cherished. And Emil, I think I want to end on that note. You know, I think it's, I think you are, please come back again. It has been an incredible conversation. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, people, please, everyone check out his channel. I mean, he's just, just he's just a monster musician in, a, in the best way. Uh, and 11,000, you want to just end off, you want to talk about your channel and just talk about things that people can contact you and how they can get in touch with you, even maybe for lessons or something, you know, just, just, just talk a little bit. Here's let me just bring up the channel, and of course, his incredible uh, website as well. Go ahead. I'm very grateful to you to have given me the opportunity through your very um, deep and meaningful questions, which are reflecting your intellect, um, to speak about things which are very difficult to define. And I appreciate you taking the time to do so for the people who watch you and uh, read you. And I hope that um, if my personal experience and journey in life in music was blessed by having met very early this very old lady, um, as I told you in the beginning of our conversation today, I feel very humbled and truly honored to be a hyphen between her and my students. And um, I feel like if I can apply as I do my best to intuitively reach um, when they ask me to what is the core of what means to them to be a musician and how to reach it for this or that uh, aspect of music making, I think it's, um, it's a tribute to my teacher through me because I'll never be her and nobody will be the me that I was then. But there are some things, and that's why I wrote this uh, memoir, which are um, timeless in that sense. And yes, you read those um, quotes of hers about me. It's weird for me to hear it, even today, so many, so many decades later. Weird because the very last month of her life, she was on a bedridden the situation and uh, I asked her, which could appear very impolite, but I had a certain intimacy with her, so to say, that allowed me to ask her is, aren't you bored to be in bed? And she told me, I'm training my brain from falling apart by solfaging in my head um, the food, the well tempered clavier voice by voice speaking, not even singing. And I was holding her hand while she was there lying, and she was starting a few, like do, re, mi, fa, sol, fa, mi, la, re, sol, la, sol, fa, mi, and I would go, sol, la, si, do, re, do, si, mi, la, re, mi, re, do, si. And somehow, unexpectedly, I realized that it was a very, nowadays I think of it as a very moving moment. At the time, it was just what it was, which is to, to speak the voices of the fugues of Bach with my teacher in the silence of her um, to be deathbed room. I find it very refreshing because I think that she showed me that I should be always very humble with music and musicians. And I thought she who knew everybody before me of the greatest, she was very respectful of me who was a big promise at the time. And uh, I find that to be respectful of another student is also to be respectful of their difference and for their what they're yearning. So that's why I hope that I am a successful hyphen for them. You are. And I thank you for having me. You are really a treat. The great <laughs> Professor Emil Namoff, everyone. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you and all the best.